Good morning, everybody. Wow, it sounds like we have twice as many people as we usually have, mostly on the left. My left, your right. So welcome, thank you for coming. My name is Todd, and I'm one of the elders here at Trinity. And if you're visiting this morning, thank you for choosing to worship with us, and I'm hopeful that our time together will be edifying to the Lord and good for all of us. And as we have for many weeks, we're working through the book of Matthew, specifically the Sermon on the Mount. And here at Trinity, we preach expositionally, which simply means we're working through the book one passage at a time. This is the best way to understand what the original context was for the original authors, as well as what the application is for us today. So where are we at today? I just told you we are in the Sermon on the Mount. So in weeks past, we learned about the different antithesis statements and these ethics for kingdom heirs. And uh, Jesus starts by quoting, you've heard it said, and then he goes on to explain, but I say to you, don't get angry and don't look at a woman with lust. And if you're asked to go one mile, go two instead and forgive your enemies. In fact, show radical forgiveness, supernatural forgiveness. And Jesus in chapter five challenges his listeners with these words, be perfect as your father in heaven is, imperfect, is perfect. And we've also looked at the practical application to the kingdom heirs, what the kingdom looks like through giving, through praying and through fasting and practicing these things in secret, knowing that your father who sees in secret will reward you. And then Alex went through the model prayer, the Lord's Prayer, which commands us to forgive in a way that's completely foreign to us, but not to God. And today we begin to look at the social conduct of the King of Mares. How are we supposed to act with each other and with other people? How should we engage with our brothers and sisters in the church? And how should we engage with the people in the world at large? And the principle we should keep in mind today is judgment isn't possible without judging. So let's read the passage, I'll pray, and then we'll dig into what Jesus has to say about judging. Matthew chapter seven, verse one. Judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. Do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this day and for your word. And we just ask for discernment as we we unpack this and help us to understand this important message for us and help us to have eyes that see, ears that hear and minds that understand. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So besides John 3.16, this is probably the verse most often quoted by both unchristians and Christians alike. And while it's often quoted, it is more often misunderstood and mis- misapplied. So non-Christians actually use this verse to judge Christians for judging others, which is judging. And Christians use this verse to opt out of judging completely seeing it as harsh and unloving to judge the actions of other people. But the question Jesus answers today is, who, when, and especially how should we judge? This passage is often plucked out of its context and used to justify everything from tolerance to the exact opposite, judgmentalism. So another thing to note is a theological word called a pretext. This is often called a pretext verse And a pretext verse is when we take a verse out of its context and use it to justify a specific point of doctrine. In this case, telling people to not ever judge and then using this passage to justify not ever judging. A real world example comes from one of my hobbies, photography, and there's an effect in photography called bokeh. And if you know anything about photography, you should know this word, but it's a Japanese word and it means hazy or blurry. So if you look at a lot of portrait photography, this effect is seen when the foreground is crystal clear and the background is completely obscured. 
So the preferred state in portrait photography is, again, where the subject is right in front of you, so the portrait would be completely clear, and the background is blurry or hazy. And this has to do with the more expensive the lens, the faster and larger the aperture, the better depth of field you can get, and the more blurry the background can be. So we can do this to scripture also. We can focus so much on one verse that we can miss completely the larger context. We can take a verse out of its context, and while it may say what we want it to say, it often doesn't mean what God intends it to mean. In the same way, a pretext verse is a verse that is taken out of its context, and by focusing on it, we obscure everything around it. Around it. So while this is preferable in photography, this is not preferred in interpretation or application. When interpreting scripture, we, all wanna be, we wanna be able to see the big picture. In today's passage, not judging is often taken out of context and applied to every kind of judging, which is not what Jesus has in mind. And this is what we seek to do each week as pastors. Teach what it means to the original audience, but also what it means for us today. Bridging the interpretive gap from the original hearers to us makes the difference in knowing how to apply the passage. So if we look at 7.1, we'll unpack this. And Jesus, speaking to the crowd on the, on the mount, says, judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce you will be judged, and with the measure you use it will be measured to you. So is Jesus really saying never, ever, ever, ever judge anybody or anything? Of course not. Excuse me. As I said before, our context is everything, and we know that Jesus has been consisting in teaching his disciples to not be like the hypocrites. Well, even a cursory flyby of this passage could tell us that we can't be like the hypocrites if we don't judge what the, what the hypocrites are doing. Jesus has to judge the Pharisees in order to call them hypocrites, and exhorting us to not be like them requires us to judge them also. So this can't mean that. It can't mean don't ever, ever, ever judge. Jesus can't be telling us not to judge. And if we look deeper in the passage, we see that that is exact. Jesus is not telling us that we shouldn't judge. He's actually telling us how to judge. So the ESV says judge not, but many of the other translations like NIV, C <coughs> CSB, excuse me, and CSB and the NASB say do not judge. And most times this is the only part of this passage quoted. And when people say Jesus says that you shouldn't judge, what most people really mean is you shouldn't judge me, right? But really verse one and two are a warning to us and what Jesus is telling us is judge harshly and you will be judged harshly by God. And he says, with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. Now if we look at this, the real question is who is going to judge the person that judges? Some think that this passage is saying, if you judge unfairly, then you too will be judged unfairly. But it's not. This is not a warning that if you judge other people harshly, that they will judge you harshly. This is much more serious, friends. And this is called a divine passive. What that means is that the writers in the Bible often omit God as an agent of the action to avoid using God's name. So here the agent of the action is God himself. So when Jesus says, with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, he is talking about God judging us. And we can also see the same type of language in Mark 4, 24, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. And Mark adds, and even more. That measure you use, that provokes this imagery of grain contracts in the first century in which they frequently specify the grain delivery and payment would be measured with the same instrument to make sure that there was no cheating. And the purchaser would bring 
the measuring instrument. The purchaser would have a device to measure out how much, how much of the grain they were taking. And this ensured that the supplier did not cheat the, the purchaser. And the New International Greek New Testament commentary says, the very act of judgment establishes a set of criteria to which the one judging must expect an answer before God. And the suggestion in that creates a set of criteria in relation to which it were better that one did not ask to be judged. The background thought is of one's own need for God's mercy and forgiveness. And that's the idea there behind God judging us, the divine passive, is that we don't want to be judged by God if we're judging other people incorrectly. The parallel passage in Luke 6, 37 says, do not judge and you will not be judged. Do not condemn and you will not be condemned. Forgive and you will be forgiven. And if you think about it, it would be disastrous if we interpreted this verse to mean never judge. And consequently, consequently, then we never used any judgment at all. How would we discern right from wrong without judging and using judgment? Even day-to-day, -day, seemingly mundane tasks require judgment on some level. You use judgment today, deciding what to eat, what to wear, and where to sit. <laughs> Works out because you're all mostly on the side of the room. All of these things require us to judge and use judgment. You think about children, for example, that is one of our most important roles as a parent is teaching them how to judge and then teaching them how to use judgment. And when they learn from judging and they apply it as judgment, then they earn wisdom. When they cross the street for the first time by themselves, they will need to use judgment and they will use the judgment that you have trained them to use. Because you love them, you have trained them to use good judgment. And what responsible parent would train their children incorrectly? And behind the judgment you are teaching them, you are teaching them about wisdom. If you teach them to judge correctly, they will hopefully use wisdom and judgment to make choices that will help them flourish. But it's not just about the process, right? It's not just approaching an intersection and looking both ways. So it does them no good at all to just approach the curb, look both ways, and step out into traffic, right? That would be catastrophic. In fact, they have to approach the curb, judge that it's safe based on what you've taught them safe looks like. Cars not speeding at them, maybe the little guy in the crosswalk signal, but they, they need to know when it's safe to cross. They don't need to know just how to look both ways. And in that same way, Jesus is teaching us how to apply judging and when we need to use it as judgment. And in regards to judgment, I was reading this week and there was this story about this woman in Aspen, Colorado, who is hiking with her husband. And as they're walking down the trail, they see a very large black bear approaching. And they step off the trail to let the bear pass. So if you can imagine for a second, walking on a hiking trail and seeing a very large black bear approaching and then stepping off the trail to allow it to pass. They stepped off the trail, let the bear pass, and the bear walk, walked by, and according to Janet Jansen, the victim, almost as an afterthought, the bear looked back at her and bit her on the leg, puncturing her thigh. If you're my Facebook friend, you may have seen this story linked with my caption, I'm a bear, fool. <laughs> I find it amusing that they stepped off the trail to let the bear pass by, almost like it was a right-of-way issue. Bears are wild animals. The bear was destroyed by the wildlife department for doing what bears do, bite humans. When humans don't take them seriously, they get bitten. And this is, this is the exhortation to judge rightly, my friends. If you see a large black bear approaching, there might be something better to do than just step off the trail to let them pass by. The word judge here in Greek has multiple meanings, but in this context, this passage is the word censoriously, 
censoriously implies a disposition to be severely critical and condemnatory. As a matter of fact, this is where we get the words critic and criticism. So we can see that Jesus is talking about judging critically. Judge not and you will not be judged. What he's talking about is critically or harshly or unfairly. And when we look at it in context, Jesus has been building up to this from the first moment he started to speak. He warns his followers about unrighteous anger. And in chapter 5, he told us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And in the model prayer, Jesus commands us to forgive others as we have been forgiven. And we should think about how we have been forgiven, friends. We have been forgiven graciously, mercifully, and eternally. And John Stott, talking about this kind of critical judging, says this. It does not mean to assess people critically, but to judge them harshly. The serious critic is a fault finder who is negative and destructive towards other people and enjoys actively seeking out their failures. He puts the worst possible construction on their motives. He pours cold water on their schemes and is ungenerous towards their mistakes. Pours cold water on their schemes and is ungenerous towards their mistakes. You may even know people like this, the ones who shoot holes in all your plans, and they constantly complain and they they evaluate evaluate you unfairly. And this leads to all kinds of sin For example, this can lead to gossip, of which I have been guilty before. Uh, Gossip is a terrible sin because you're not just judging someone harshly, but you're inviting someone else to judge them harshly as well. And think about this, this type of judging this week. And think about if you see it in your own life. And Stott also attributes this to our very real idolatry of self, and our almost insatiable desire to be our own gods. Basically, we want to be the judges and we want to do the judging, right? Because we want to establish the standard for everybody else but ourselves. Do you know who Fred Rogers is? I hope so. Fred Rogers is from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. The second most successful children's show of all time, second only to... Sesame Street, thank you, Dalen. <laughs> Second only to Sesame Street. Did you know that Mr. Rogers, Mr. Rogers graduated from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary? And he was ordained as a Presbyterian minister in 1963. And Mr. Rogers is telling a story to a friend of his, and he says, years ago, my wife and I were worshiping in a little church with friends of ours, and we were on vacation, and I was in the middle of a homiletics course at the time. And during the sermon, I kept ticking off every mistake I thought the preacher, and he must have been 80 years old, was making. When this interminable sermon finally ended, I turned to one of my friends, intending to say something critical about the sermon, and I stopped myself when I saw the tears running down her face. And she whispered to me, he said exactly what I needed to hear. That was really a seminal experience for me. I was judging, and she was needing and the Holy Spirit responded to need, not to judgment. Friends, we need to guard against this kind of judging and to guard against this kind of critical spirit. I included this illustration just in case you're thinking this sermon is interminable, (laughs) which in fact means endless. (laughs) Remember who the audience here that Jesus is talking to. He's talking to his followers, but he's also talking to the Pharisees that are there. The Pharisees who practice a a kind of self-centered righteousness. And that's how this whole sermon flows, right? What Jesus doesn't want to happen is for these people who are sitting under the guidance of the self-centered righteous Pharisees to become self-centered Jesus followers. So how then should we judge again? We should judge humbly and graciously because we have been judged humbly and graciously and mercifully. We've been reconciled eternally. Is this a cause for pride or harsh criticizing of those who haven't been reconciled? No. It's an opportunity for witnessing and evangelism. And it should lead us to gratitude, friends. So don't lose your thankfulness, because that's what fuels your witness. 
And if we keep looking at the passage, if we can go on to verse 3, we see that now Jesus has warned them, and here he gives them a sermon illustration. And he starts by asking these two rhetorical questions. Why do you see the speck that, in his, that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is a log in your own eye? So there is the rhetorical questions, which are an illustration that he's using, but he admonishes them, you hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. So if we look, we see the words brother several times in there, and that gives us the context of who he's talking about. John talks about this a little bit in chapter 4, verse 11, where he talks about brothers and sisters do not slander one another. And then he goes on to say, there is only one lawgiver and judge, the one who is able to save and destroy, but you, who are you to judge your neighbor? And then he says in Revelation, which you just heard, coincidentally, Revelation verse 12, chapter 20, verse 12 says, Another book was open, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done. God will judge us all in his standard as who is written in the book of life. So primarily, Jesus is talking about our brothers and sisters and the kind of judging that we need to do with each other. Excuse me, and he, and he says, this is what the Pharisees should have done. They should have made loving God much less of a burden. Instead they, ju- instead, they used the Jews' need, need for forgiveness, need to come close to God to make it better for themselves. And this is how we should be making it easier on each other, not by not judging, but by judging ourselves first, then helping each other see the sin in their lives and battling with them to help them overcome it. we look, my second point, remove the log, then judge lovingly, is exactly what Jesus is saying. We shouldn't ignore the tough teaching of the Bible or skip it because it makes us uncomfortable. This is a time for us to dive in and do what Jesus is asking us to do because he equips us and powers us through the power of the Holy Spirit to do it. We should pay attention to that and heed the Spirit. And he tells us to take care of ourselves first, to take the log out of our own eye before helping our brothers and sisters taking the speck out of theirs. And if you've flown Southwest, you may know that there are several videos of their safety briefing that have gone viral, and they've made an art kind of out of mocking this information, this information that could save your life, right? So it's entertaining, but it's probably not very helpful. And in April 2018, Southwest had an actual emergency, and a passenger's video that went viral showed that most of the passengers were wearing their oxygen masks wrong. So it was funny but not helpful, and it ended up they all put their masks on wrong. That, that is not helpful. So the important thing is to how to do it properly, and what's the rule? The rule is put your mask on first, And if you don't, the consequences could be deadly for yourself and for other people. And that, again, is what Jesus is saying here in a very loose illustration. Look at yourself first, take the log out, then you can help your brother or sister take the speck out of their eye. And when you do that, judge lovingly. And another reason for putting our mask on is because when we're safe, we can help someone do this. And And in this case, we're talking about survival, right? If the plane decompresses, you're going to want to have your mask on so you can help them put their mask on. Take care of your own eye first. Then help your brothers and sisters keep theirs clear. Jesus is using hyperbole here. He's not actually talking about specks and logs. He's talking about this this ridiculous example of someone with the speck of their eye that you're pointing out when you have a log in yours. And we can see this, this very vivid Old Testament example of this kind of problem in 2 Samuel 12, 
You're probably familiar with this story, but this is King David after lying with Bathsheba, ensuring that Uriah, her husband, is killed in battle. And then the prophet Nathan comes to see him. And Nathan tells the story of this little you that was dearly loved by this poor man. It says that he so loved the you that they treated it like a member of their family. And then along came a rich man who took it. And he took it because he did not want to use his own lamb to serve a rich man, a traveler coming to visit. So David, unable to see the truth clearly because the massive log of adultery and murder angrily demands that the life of the man, he demands that this man be put to death. Nathan points out, you are that man. You are the man that stole the dearly loved you. While we're reading this, we think David should have seen this coming, right? But in a smaller context, we can justify a lot of wrong behavior with selfish justification. And Jesus knows that. And that's why he's telling us to examine ourselves and see if there's a log there. So a couple things to note there. The word for speck is literally speck, (laughs) sawdust, something dry. The King James uses the word moat, which is super descriptive and literally means a tiny piece of a substance. But the idea here is small. Well, the word for log is more like a rafter. So this isn't just a log. This is the kind of log that you're going to use to put your roof on or your floor on your house. This is big. This is the hyperbole that Jesus is using, that you have a log, the kind that you use to build houses. This is construction grade log. This is huge in your eye, and you're pointing out a dust speck in your brother's and sister's eye. This is not a trigger or branch. This is a beam. And it would be ridiculous to ignore it to point out the speck, right? If you had a rafter in your eye, you should want to take the rafter out of your eye. And Jesus uses the ridiculous to get his point across. He says, see to your own eye first. Don't point out a speck when you have construction lumber sticking out of your eye. And this is what we're doing in discipleship with each other. Helping each other to see the specks in each other's eyes and hopefully getting other people to help us examine ourselves and see the speck that we might be missing in our eye. Not only see it, but remove it. And if you look around at your life and as you walk this out this week, think about where the log is in your eye. What kind of logs do you have in your eye? And if you don't, then you can help graciously and gently help your brothers and sisters remove the speck from theirs. I don't think this is a case where we're ever going to have no specks or no logs. The Christian life is about walking this out day to day examining ourselves, seeing the specks and the logs in our eyes, removing those. This is why we take communion, so we have a moment of reflection so we can examine what it is we're missing. And then we can go to Jesus, we can pray for repentance and for faithfulness and confess and then take part in the Lord's Supper, remembering that he has done it all perfectly on our behalf and went to the cross for you. If we look on in verse 6, we see, do not give dogs what is holy and do not throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn to attack you. And the last point is, be discerning and don't squander your treasure. And this passage is a little bit different because it's not talking about dust and logs. So we've moved on to talking about dogs and pigs. So some see this as a segue to the next passage, but I tend to agree with Sam Storms who says, this verse gives us the opposite danger, the danger of being overindulgent and undiscerning. In loving our enemies, going the extra mile, not judging unjustly, there is the pearl, excuse me, the peril of becoming wishy-washy and of failing to make essential distinctions between right and wrong, truth and falsehood. Whereas the saints are not to be judges, neither are they to be simpletons. This is not admonishing us to not ever give the gospel to certain people or to not judge actions in society at large. 
In this passage, we see another literary device called a chiasmus, which is a reversal in the order of words and two otherwise parallel phrases. So that's a lot of language that simply means the first sentence lines up with the last and the second sentence lines up with the third. Simply means that the dog, the pigs will trample the pearls underfoot and the dogs will turn to attack you. And the first thing to know in this passage, this is not your dog. It's not Millie, it's not Pippa, it's not Tucker. Well, it could be Tucker. <laughs> but it's certainly not Penny. In the Jewish economy, dogs are filthy animals. They are not the kind of domesticated dogs that we see here. They roam in packs and their their problems. And they're filthy animals just like pigs are. And if we look ahead in 2 Peter 2, verse 22, he mentions dogs and pigs together also. Like a dog that returns to its vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. And the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. So if we look at who Peter is quoting here, he's quoting from Proverbs, Proverbs and he's talking about false teachers. If you know me, you, love, you know I love pig as much as anybody. Pig is the origin of bacon. And, but the Jews did not eat them. And they're considered dirty and stupid. They were difficult to keep. And pigs can't be driven like sheep which for a mostly nomadic people, this presents a big problem. If you spend most of your time traveling from place to place without a place to land, then you're not gonna wanna take animals with you that are hard to drive. So in this passage, it says, we are not to give to the dogs what is holy. And I think the key to understanding this passage is looking deeper, deeper to understand who the dogs and pigs are and what the pearls are and what holy means. And if we look forward in Matthew 15, you'll find the story of this Canaanite woman who asked for a crumb of bread from the master's table. And in that passage, dogs is mentioned and is referring to Gentiles. So we could for a moment think that this is talking about Gentiles, but it isn't. And we know that because Jesus spends a considerable amount of time ministering, evangelizing, and talking to Gentiles. And considering that, how much time he spends on that, this can't mean that. So some of the clues to the context, if we look back into Pastor David's uh, sermon from a couple weeks ago, from chapter six, verses 22, David talked about the, the eyes being the lamp to the body. And he talked about these different kinds of transmission, inter, intermission and extramission, the idea that the eye reflects and projects what's on the inside. And what we should be transmitting is internal righteousness with the witness to the presence of the Holy Spirit. And the treasure that we're taking with us is the gospel, friends. That is our treasure, and that is the pearl. Our treasure is the gospel of Jesus, and it's a gospel that leads to life. If we look at this word holy, it's a Greek word that means many different things. And a lot of words you're familiar with derive from the same root, words like saints and sanctification. And the idea is that these are things that are set apart for a holy purpose. And if we look at at pearls, this word, the names Marguerite and Margaret come from them. And pearls is mentioned in Matthew 13. If you remember, there's a parable in there about this hidden treasure that a merchant finds in a field, that he goes back and he sells everything he owns to acquire it. The pearl is the kingdom of God obtained through the gospel. That is the treasure. So some commentators have theorized that the pearls look like peas, so pigs would eat them, but would find they were worthless nutritionally, they would likely break their teeth, and that is why they would get angry and turn on you and devour you. but I don't think that's what that means. If the pearl is the gospel and it's set set apart for kingdom heirs, then the pigs and the swine are likely those people hostile to the gospel. (coughs) Excuse me. The early church read this as an unregenerate people and used this passage to exclude unbaptized persons from communion, withholding communion, 
so as not to give to the dogs that which is holy. But that also is not the specific purpose of this saying. Jesus is not saying that we should withhold the gospel from certain people who regard it as, who we regard as unworthy of it. But he does recognize that after sustained rejection and reproach, it is appropriate to move on to others. Sam Storm says, therefore the dogs and pigs are, are not simply unbelievers, but they are defiant and persistently hateful and vindictive unbelievers. And Calvin writes, it ought to be understood that dogs and swine are names given not to every kind of debauched men or to those who are destitute of the fear of God, of true, excuse me, destitute of the fear of God and of true godliness, but to those who by clear evidences have manifested a hardened contempt of God so that their disease appears to be incurable. These are people who are openly and curably hostile to the gospel and to God. So if we keep looking at this passage, we see this negative command of what we're not supposed to do. We're not supposed to give them what is holy. And we're not supposed to cast our pearls in front of them. But this infers this positive, right? That we should give it to those who won't trample it underfoot and who won't turn and attack you. And again, we're not to judge that. But I think we have to ask ourselves, because of fear of this very thing, being judged and being attacked, are we casting any pearls at all? The fate of this world is already ordained and we've been given a mission. He's called us into a priesthood to bring a message of reconciliation. Found in his son and taken to those that haven't heard or haven't believed. And Jesus did not establish or overthrow governments. He went to the cross proclaiming a message about this kingdom of heaven he humbled himself to step down from heaven so that his death could bring us life. He calls us to put our trust in him and he promises to make us a new creation. And when we're a new creation, then we will be able to see the logs and the specks in our own eyes. Friends, don't expect unbelievers to see <laughs> the specks in their own eyes or the logs for that matter. I didn't and I would wager you didn't either. It is the gospel that gives us new vision. It gives us eyes to see, right? As we close, I want you to hear the words from 2 Corinthians 2.14. But thanks be to God who in Christ always leads us in triumphal procession and through us spreads the fragrance of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are the aroma of Christ to God among those who are being saved and among those who are perishing. To one, a fragrance from death to death, and to other, a fragrance from life to life. Who, have, who is sufficient for these things? <coughs> Excuse me. For we are not like so many peddlers of God's word, but as men of sincerity, as commissioned by God, in the sight of God, we speak in Christ. Leave the judgment of unbelievers to God and look to your own house first. Serve the church by seeking holiness with your brothers and sisters in Christ and witnessing to the world about this God-man who went to the cross for us and them and raises us up to new life for eternity. This is the pearl worth everything we own. Don't keep it for yourself. Let's pray.